This is the Mad Dragon Podcast. Okay, so um, welcome to um, John Fidel from Excel Sports Management for Academy. Um, so you're a player manager for um, several of our NRLW players um, on contract for this season. So, um, John, can you introduce yourself, please, to everyone? Um, Jess, uh, my name is John Fidel. I'm from Excel Sports Management, and we've also got an academy which we've just started up. It's called Excel Sports Academy, which is a non profit for profit organization that runs around and trying to develop young kids, get them off their backsides, get them into the game. Yep. Um, so can you, uh, yeah, tell us a bit about yourself and also what's a what's a day in the life of this full sweat? Just run us through a typical day for you in your um, line of work. I've been an accredited agent for about eight years. Um, I have been in the NRL space for about 30 years in terms of coaching and developing players. I used to do that on my um, days off on Sundays and also Saturdays, um, work with a few kids and be able to get them upskilled and get them ready to development, um, such as Harold Matz and SG Ball, what have you. But in saying all that, we used to get them into management and I found that I wasn't really satisfied with the results in management. So hence the reason... I became an agent because I wasn't a fan of agents. Um, but I had a business plan, which was not so much about a typical player agent. It was more about development and training programs, which we started about eight years ago. And we're at the stage where we're now Australia-wide doing training camps. Um, we got one in um, Townsville on the 6th and 7th of um, July. I've got a coaching seminar also in Queensland on the 4th of July, which um, and our pre-season um, for Sydney starts and in Queensland starts at the end of September all the way through until they go into a development program, whether it be Tasha Gale, Harvey Normans, um, um, Harold Matz, Jersey Flag, whatever the team may be. So they're way ahead of everyone else and that involves a lot of sprint coaching, one percenters in attack, defence. There's a lot of... Um, a lot of in the program to get them upskilled to see what their testing levels are. And we even um, do Broncos tests to make sure that when they go in, we know what their times need to be. So they've reached those targets before they go to a um, a training or pre-season program. So they're actually ahead of everyone else. Um, a day in the life of me, I still, um, I'm a general manager of a company and I'm still doing that because I'm flexible doing sports management and, working for a company at the same time myself um, because I still work with junior development players. So I generally have on an average day um, probably about 20 phone calls a day um, and that's generally a mixture of uh, coaches, development officers, players. Um, When it's NRL W season before we start the contract window, while everyone's trying to wait for the CBA, I was way ahead of everyone else. We started talking about all that probably in February, um, March. We had conversations with certain coaches. Um, then we pretty much started the contracting windows when the CBA opened up, and that sort of delayed everything because there was a fair bit to get through there. But we had a fair bit of an input into that, um, which we were really happy with the results. The RLPA sort of, um, fine tuned where it should be. So I don't know if you remember, but it was at six hundred thousand the cap, which mm-hmm. is now raised to nine hundred thousand, and it goes up. Uh, minimum um, salary is thirty thousand. It was set at twenty eight, mind you, after they negotiated it. Then it went to thirty, and then we've um, it will go up to thirty four next year. Um, there was a lot happening with that, so we had templates of what the um, what it was going to look like, and unfortunately the Actual contract is the same contract as last year with a few additions into it. Um, And then you sort of need to read every part of the contracts now because every club sort of does things a little bit different, although it's from the NLW. Um, That took a lot of my time, to be honest with you. Um, Letters of offers, I'm sort of old school. I have generally a verbal agreement. And if I sort of approve that verbal agreement, it's good for whatever it is. So I'm not the sort of person that, 
waits for another offer to come in and change the deal. And I sort of know what I'm looking for. So I engage with players in the beginning, knowing what their capabilities are, where we're going to get them to, where they're, what stage they're at at the moment. Um, and I know in NRLW, which fans don't generally understand, it's not the club that you follow. It's more about where your opportunities lie and who the coach is going to be. Because if you sort of select the wrong coach for a, a new player, um, that might be the last NRLW game they can play. So you've sort of get got to get them developed with our program, with the right coaches. So fortunately for me, I work with a couple of coaches, so I know what their um, strengths are and their weaknesses are. Um, I know what sort of players they're suitable for. Um, the Dragons, um, Jamie, third year. Um, you ask Jamie now, what was he like? What's he think this year compared to his first year and his second year? He's a totally different man. The way he approaches the man management side of things. Um, the good thing about Jamie is he's he's a spines coach and he's now adapted to what an NRL team looks like and how it should be run. So running structures with the sort of speed and um, structures that females have that are totally different to the guys. Um, I find it really refreshing working with Jamie Soward because he sort of understands every player that we're talking about, their strengths and weaknesses, and we talk about other players at the same time. Yep. But an average day for me is uh, I don't generally, I can't wait. My favourite part of the day, to be honest with you, and everyone laughs at me, is when I go to bed because everything just shuts off for me. So I try and get some time with family and about 8, 30, 9 o'clock sometimes and I watch a little bit of telly and then off to bed we go. Yep. So um, you manage, um, I think it's about how many, I think it's eight, eight, eight of the um, current squad, yeah. including some development players yeah. in this 2023 Dragon squad. Can Wait, you tell I'll, us? A- I'll cut you out because I'll give you an exclusive. There might be a slight change that might come out this week. Okay. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> and, and, and oh, okay. Um, so, can you tell us a bit about those um players? Um, some, yeah, uh, obviously. Um, throw me some names. Familiar with um, Well, obviously, um, Tara McGraw West um made her debut last year. Was one of the standout rookies of the year. Um, probably become one of the best young front rowers in the um, game. Yeah, actually, some talking about her as a potential um um bolter for the New South Wales Origin side this year. Actually, um, can you tell us a bit about um? each player that you have that sign on with the Dragons this year well, let's, what, let's what start, fans can look forward to? Let's start with Tara McGraw-West. Um, what you guys saw last year is a girl that came to me a year before she debuted and she was playing for Wenties. Um, and she hit me up and wanted to get some feedback on a game and we went out and saw her and – Taro is a real interesting story. This is a girl that used to drive three hours to go to training to Wenties, three hours back home, three times a week. She sleep here on Friday, play on Saturday. Coach probably only played at 10, 20 minutes, and she thought it was the coach. And I actually said it wasn't the coach. It was actually you. You just got to change the way you play, fix up your fitness. At the end of the day, cut a long story short, I said, I'm, I do want to manage you, but you've got to commit to a program. And I need you to get to A, B, and C by September. Um, I signed her up at Norths to get her developed with the coach over there. There's a really good coach, Rob, over there. And um, when she attended my preseason in September, I'll never forget this. This is the girl that I pictured with my training. She needs about two to three years before she can get looked at in the NRW. But she said to me, before I said I need you by certain times and weights by September, our preseason, she said, I'm not going to let you down. I'm going to shock you. And I never took too much of that, but I was impressed by her attitude. And when she rocked up to my preseason, I'll never forget this. She rocked up. She jogged all the way to where we were. And we started our sprint coaching sessions. And she was just blowing everyone off the park. She lost weight. She was so fast. We did a lot of work with her. Um, and I'm just saying, Tara, wow. I ring up the North coach and I said, you know, this girl that's going to play a couple of games to get developed. I go, mate, she's going to be starting. He goes, no chance. I've seen the video footage. Well, he rings me up when she goes in the preseason. And he goes, mate, Tara McGrath-West, upgraded contract. She'd be starting. 
So that was the start of Tyra McGrath West at North, thanks to Rob and the crew at North Sydney Bears. Um, and then as we we're watching it, we we're trying to fix it at the same time. Rob was working with the two, and I worked with a guy called Pat Wesner, who's their recruiting manager, who kept an eye on They did really well with them. And then Tara, I just knew by midway through the season at North, this girl could be playing in RW this year. I ring up Jamie Soward and he goes, mate, I don't see it. I said, Jamie, you need to sign this girl every single week, week in, week out. Jamie, you need to sign this girl. I don't see it. But if you know Jamie really well, Jamie doesn't give too much away. It doesn't mean he doesn't want her. He'll just say a flat no. Um, when he says, I don't see it yet, or let me have a deeper look, it just means he's already doing homework on my back. So I'll never forget this. It was a semifinals. I played against the Tigers. Yep. Jamie rings me up and he goes, I'm over here. And I went and saw him and Snake. And we sat there in the corner, restricted area, mind you. Got had to move later on. But um, we seen the Tigers make a break yep. on the 40. And then all you see is Tara McGrath West from the 40. The first one back there to try to chase down the Tigers player who scored. First one back there trying to cut it down. Beat the fullback, beat the halves. Tara McGrath West. Tigers done another breakthrough. First player there to the troll on trying to cut down the try. Tara McGrath West. Third break. First one there was Tara McGrath West. And I know Tara personally. So nothing bothers her. But when a team is not performing and not everyone's lifting their weight, she actually gets really upset, it really hurts her. Mm. And then anyway, she got a well deserved um um rest after 30 minutes because she's done a fair bit of work and as she's coming off she went past the mean jamie and i i forgot about jamie i was worried about the plan i said tars are you okay she couldn't even talk she was tearing she was choking mm. and jamie tapped me and he said mate she's just done a solid performance for 30 minutes i guess she's not tired mate she's pissed off about the effort then as i was going back i had to move away to make sure she's okay and um then um, I got a phone call from another NLW coach. There was no spots available, mind you. Yeah. I got there was only one spot at the Dragons, and due to an injury, um, I got a phone call from another NLW coach. She goes, mate, we may need Tara McGraw West because we might have a player that can't be able to play because she's also injured. Um, but I need to know that you guys are right to get Tara McGraw West. She had to move out of Sydney. I said, mate, can you give me a call tomorrow morning and we'll have a chat? I ring up Snake and I said, Snake, if Tara McGraw West is not taking, I didn't know there was one more spot, by the way. I thought it was for a development spot. And yeah. I ring up Snake and I said, mate, there's a club that actually wants her to um, fly out and go play for him, but it's a uh, 50-50, depend on an injury, blah, blah, blah. Snake says, where are you? Jamie's been looking for you. He says, I want to talk to um, Tara after the game. She came out second half. Full guns blazing. I set up the meeting outside the stadium with Tara and Jamie, and he gave me a thumbs up. Here I'm thinking, hang on, you don't do a thumbs up without talking to me because I might have an NRW spot. He goes, mate, this is an NRW spot. I didn't want to tell you. So she he took up she took up the last spot there. So if you look at game one, Harvey Norman to NRLW is a massive speed difference. So mm. game one, there was Mona Lisa Soliola, which is another freak. They, they got gassed after 10 minutes. You can see that yeah. in game one. Game two, they probably increased it to about um, 12, 13 minutes. Um, game three, it started to pick up to about 20. So we're getting good numbers out of these players. So I ring up Tara on game four. We have our normal chit-chat of all the bad things that happen in the game, things that she's not getting right. And I never, I don't, I don't interrupt the season when they're in coaching, but it was just that for the fourth game, we had a really good chat and she says, oh, I'm going to go out there because I feel really good and I'm just going to make a difference. I just need to get me attack right, blah, blah, blah. We said a few things and when I watched game four, she just had the game of her life. Um, it was something stupid like 200 um, running metres. We're talking about, I think, 40 minutes of game time. Was uh, this the Melbourne game against I, Brisbane? I think it was, yeah. It was something stupid. It was yeah, I remember that day. I think she yeah. made the most metres of any NRLW forward in history. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then she had 
um, something like 113 post contact meters, um, zero errors, no missed tackles. She played the house down and she was in that team of the round, which doesn't mean too much to me, but it was nice for her to see that. Then the following week, we um, had another quick conversation, said that, see how you did this in attack. We need to find a way to do this in defense. My favorite game wasn't that game four. It was actually game five. If you look at that closely, her attacking and running meters, um, she was running with aggression. She was tackling with aggression and she held her own. And Jamie actually agrees with me. Her, his best game from Tara was game five. So we knew we had an origin play in the making there from back then. So we got her over to the dogs. Unfortunately, we had a, uh, a hamstring injury where there was something niggling and it was sort of um, – it was missed, but we had a second opinion and we found that there was a niggling hamstring injury, so she couldn't get much game time and that probably affected a chance at Origin. But Tara McGrath West today is a lot different than she was last year. Her headspace, her speed, uh, her body shape, the amount of work she puts in, um, she's going to have a massive year this year. She's going to be fine. We're, we're not going to wait till round four and round five to see the best time of Grow West. She's probably going to kick the um, ground starting, you'll find, from round one. Um, Tara, for me, is one of those girls that I I wish that everyone had that sort of same mindset and attitude. And I don't want to take anything away from um, anyone, but um, for me as a, a player agent and a coach, I – I've got special requirements and it's all about the headspace and the attitude, the training and, and, and being developed is something we find easy and it takes time. But if your attitude isn't hungry enough to say, I want to play for Australia, um, we're not going to tick those boxes. And Tara is one of those players that's going to be playing for Australia. Um, and it won't be long before um, Kyle Hilda um, starts to realize that she needs an impact player that's got a bit of speed um, she'll do state of origin and the state really proud when she gets out there and she'll deserve that opportunity. Um, so Tara McGraw West is going to have a really good year. Um, you guys have got another new, really good signing in Tekka. Oh, her name is Angelina uh, um, Tekka Rangi Katoa. Um, yeah. I'll just give your fans a heads up. Her name is Tekka. She, yeah. if, you, if you call Angelina, she probably won't turn around, but Tekka um, is one of those, come to me as a party girl that just love to have a fun in life, but she also plays hard. She's, no one knows this, but she was on the Australian, I think, um, tennis pro um, um, circuit to become one of the best tennis players in Australia. She was actually ahead. She was on her way to represent and maybe on our way to Wimbledon, but something switched in her head and says, Mum, I want to play league. Her mum to this day still talks about her tennis um, attributes and she was really good. Um, the photos that I see of Tekka when she was playing tennis was, I just couldn't believe. I knew she was good at tennis, but I didn't believe the the, the um, amount of trophies and um, the big stages she reached. She was actually a gun. So um, Tekka came from there and I saw her in Tasha Gal playing as a 5'8". She was so rusty, but... Every time she ran a ball, I I seen this girl that just found it easy to break a hole, and um, but she just didn't know how to play. I got a phone call from Norse that says I want this girl now, and um, I said let me find out what her attitude's like first. I just I need girls with really good attitudes because I can turn this girl into a freak if she had the right attitude. Well, we met on a couple of occasions, and then when hearing her story and talking from her heart, this girl is a must-have girl. I had to have her on board. Um, so we started that and we didn't have the greatest of starts because she had a few niggling injuries also that I didn't know about. But she went to North. She played really well and got a phone call from Johnny Strange who said, mate, and he's another good coach. He's just a, he's, he's a more of a development coach and he sort of, he's got a gift of sort of picking talent as you can see in his history. But he's one of those guys that are getting better every year, John Strange. Anyway, I saw... um. Tekka got in there. She didn't get a really good opportunity. She had a couple of niggling injuries. She had one game and she probably wasn't made for it then. But if you watch the Harvey Norman at the Bulldogs this year, so I wanted to give it a, to really get caned in the way to get a fitness where it should be after all those injuries. And if you watch her at the Bulldogs, I, I'm, I'm going to say it, that I thought she was the best prop forward out there. 
Um, she made so much um, menacing runs down the middle. She made a lot of metres in all her stats. Uh, her numbers are really high. Um, the um, Tekka still carried an injury while she's doing that, but she sort of knows how to manage her injury a lot better now, which gets her to play full games. Um, Jamie rang me up straight away um, asking questions. And I said, look, let's just see how we go with stats. But Tekka needed someone that's going to say, um, you know what, I see more than a prop in you because no one knows that she played halves. She can also play lock. She can also mm-hmm. kick goals. So Jamie's aware of that. He picked up on that now too. So you'll find her playing a couple of positions. Um, then you've got a girl called Sarah Satia. We picked up at the age of 15. We brought her over to the dogs, to Tash Gale. She did really well, went back home, came back again. After having a break, she missed family. At a young age, you do miss home. So she came to the dogs a couple of times. And she. this is her third season in NRLW. And the first season was a bit rusty, not much game time, but she was just finding her feet. And that's the standard um, under Calvin Wright. And then the second season under Calvin Wright, I... After game one and game two, I said to this girl, something's not right. They're missing something. Yeah, um, There's nothing wrong with your game. We need to change your opportunities, get people in Sydney, get to know you. So we we sort of worked out to get her down to Sydney and play for the dogs to um, to get a name out there. But we had a big preseason. Um, Sarah put a lot of training into what she did. She didn't want to put in a predicament of not getting a club, so for a third season. And... From round one, after first performance round one in um, Bulldogs, um, I started getting a couple of phone calls about Sarah. So what mm-hmm. we're trying to achieve by round five, six, I got from round one. By round three, I pretty much had a fair bit of coaches chasing Sarah for NRLW nice and early, as they all do. Um, her body shape, the way she runs, um, she hit a bit of an injury, but we know she's got experience. So that was also on Jamie's radar. And then we have a... I'll tell you this freak, um, Alexis Tornane. Alexis Tornane, this is a story that nobody knows that you're going to hear first. Um, she arrived in Australia um, and she got one training session with me, just one, with her sister Brooke, her older sister Brooke, and we had a few other guys there. I realised when I first saw her run, this girl is going to be one special player. That's the yep. first thing that went in my head, and I haven't had this call for a long time. So you had the likes of Tara McGraw West. I said, this girl's going to go all the way. But Alexis Tornane, I said, this girl will be ringing and uh, ticking every single box in one year, and she's extremely raw. So as she arrived, she just got named the num- uh, under-18s player of the year for New Zealand, which is massive. Yep. <laughs> then she arrived, done a session with me. She went straight to the Bulldogs camp. Done training there. I watched the trial game, a trial game, and I said, this girl is very special. After that trial game, this is a something I haven't shared. I ring up Jamie Sow and I said, Jamie, I've got one special player that if you don't tell me you want her now, you're going to be fighting against other NRW coaches to get her signed. He goes, mm-hmm. to sign a Tasha Gale player, it's – very impossible until the season's finished. Generally, it's a player of the year and a couple of really good players, one or two maybe um, in a development squad. But to get one into NRW, you need mm-hmm. to wait until the season finishes. I said, I'm sweet with that. But if you do wait that long, I'm not going to promise you an opportunity to get this goal. You believe in her now, then we'll commit to the Dragons because behind me in, in the headspace of a player agent that's also a coach, I'm not thinking of NRW. That was too easy for me. What yep. I was thinking is getting Jamie Soward with the way he trains. He's a bit cold and he's very direct and he's and he's very caring at the same time. But he he knows exactly what we're trying to achieve and he implements like the extra, you know, professional version of how a player should play. So he's picked up two years of experience of coaching. This is his third year. He knows where he went wrong. He knows what he needs to fix. He's got a brain on him that really works for us. So I pestered him with a couple of phone calls and I said, look, she's got a trial game this week against the Sharks um, somewhere in Reesby or um, Chester Hill somewhere, Terry Lamb Oval, I think it was. He says, mate, you're going to make me look like a nitty. If I sign a girl 
after a Tasha Gale trial game, it's going to look um, um, it's going to look quite pathetic. I'm not going to take that gamble, but just to to satisfy your needs, John, I'm going to send a, another scout there. And I trust what you say, John, but I got to send someone else. So not a drama. I got out there. She played first half of Tash Gale. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I get a message from Jamie. He goes, mate, she's not playing second half Tash Gale. She's playing a half in Harvey's. And I said, I didn't approve that. So at the end of the day, they played her in the Harvey's. So they had to send another person to have a look at her. And who rocks up? Snake. Snake's yep. got a good eye. Don't get fooled by Snake, mate. He's got a really good eye. Very switched on man. Yeah, probably no, Snake, yeah. Most, probably one of the most lovable human beings. Mm. I think I like Snake more than Sour, to be honest. He's more approachable, but don't tell Jamie that. Um, in saying that, I get a phone call that Sunday night from Jamie, and he and I said, how'd you go? Because I know before you tell him anything, you're going to be sending me an offer for this girl. He goes, John, what's killing me is both scouts said, sign her now. Exactly what you said. Get her on board now. And so now all three of you are saying it, but for me, it doesn't look good when you sign a player from Tasha Gale after trial game. I'm trying to wait. I said, mate, you got till Monday. Take your time. He says, give me till Monday. So I went through footages and everything. Rings me up on Monday and he says, she's going to be part of the um, the Dragons in 223. She was the first official player to be told that she's going to be playing NRLW after one trial game in the Bulldogs. Mm. Uh, and he's player of the year. And look at the gamble this smart coach took. She ended up captaining the Bulldogs, co-captain the Bulldogs with Chelsea McKeera. They were minor premiers. They nearly um, won the grand final. They were minor premiers. She didn't play all games in Tasha Gale. She got named the Tasha Gale Player of the Year. Yeah. Then she got selected into the city squad. And then she got the under-19s Tasha Gale Player of the Year for that. That, yeah. well, that just, that's, that's Alexis. And I can tell you, after her first Harvey Norman round game, which I tried to hold off as much as I can, but um, they got a coach by the name of Craig Sandercock took over halfway through the year. Now, I wasn't overly impressed with the coach that had him in the beginning. There's a lot of reasons why. Um, but Craig Sandercock's one of those masterpiece coaches that has coached over 600 first grade games as an assistant coach, head coach of whole KR in the Super League. He was he really gets it. And he was transitioning from male to female game. So he mm-hmm. had to fine-tune he put a lot of work into Alexis and um, um, she got, you know, under 90s National Player of the Year or the Opus Player of the Year. That was just bloody yeah. amazing for me. Um, and then we had to announce that she made NLW and what people don't realise, back home in New Zealand, they all know the two and Arnies, um, And they now she sort of increased that depth of females that want to play rugby league and come to Australia because they want to be the next Alexis and she hasn't even ticked the goals yet. We're nowhere near it. This girl's going to be representing. Um, she'll be hopefully selected for the. I can't see why she's not going to be selected for the under 19s um, New South Wales State of Origin team. She's capable of playing in the Opens, to be honest with you. Um, but I don't do the selections. Yeah. Um, she's she'll end up being an international player. I, I'm going to make a call and say she'll definitely be playing playing international by 2025. And I've got a funny feeling in me she might be even playing 224. When I say international, she'll be representing a, her, a country. And um, I don't want to say too much yet, but I, I can see her playing for an international team then. So two Ananes have one amazing family that have this thing. Anything to do with football, they take extremely serious. And they talk as a family. And there's Brooke, the oldest. There's a son, by the way. Yep. Um, and they got Alexis and they got Trinity and Paige. Trinity and Paige arrived towards the end of um, the season um, recently because the family has now moved over here because they're making football a, a career path for these girls. When you see Trinity and Paige play, they're both under 16. You're going to you're gonna freak. Um, I think they're going to be named in the school girls squad for the under 16s for New South Wales, just so that you're aware, they're very, very special players. Yep. Um, so the two owners are going to have, I believe, all three sisters, um, Paige and Trinity and, and Lexus, going to be playing NLW, hopefully for the same team and all together within the next two years. We're going to try and get an exemption. Um, Salvi's already seen him and he's already hit me up for him. I said, mate, they're 15 and 16, but he's got a knife for talent. He's already talking about him now. 
Um, in saying that, you've got so we've got on the four forwards Tara, Tekka, um, Alexis, Sarah Satia. Then we got Renee Targa. You all know Renee Targa, she's a real yeah. professional. What people don't know about to Renee Target is she, um, uh, what she does behind the scenes, she actually professionally lives and breathes um, her program. She understands the, the the well-being and the mindset of what you need to prepare for. She's uh, a girl that um, helps and loves working with junior girls that want to make a career path out of playing football. So she she's, she's working with nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds. She works with a lot of these girls. Does like that out behind the scene. I think it's called Target Fitness or something of the like. But Renee's a very professional. She's like the grandmother of that group because she's the oldest one in that group of um, our girls that are in that squad. Yeah. But Renee, Renee is she's a real nippy, solid girl. Um, there's been a couple of times watching her play last year. I used to think, mate, she's going to get injured, but yeah. she. Never came close to being injured, and she definitely doesn't show it. But she does her recovery really well. She does a um, her warm up is m- most important. She p- knows how to prepare for a game. She's not one of those girls who will say, "Well, she'll be if the game's on Saturday." She'll do a prep work or Friday. She'll take the day off work, do everything she needs to do. Um, then she'll try and get a good night's rest. Then she'll wake up early, prepare herself in the morning for the game. It's quite a special player, Renee. So I think we don't need to say too much about Renee because I think most of your fans know a fair bit about her. Do you see? Um, well, yeah. Um, she's played a fair bit of positions when she hasn't really nailed down a spot in the starting team, but obviously those good, uh, more experienced players in front of her. Uh, with the departure of um, well, Keely Davis and Quincy Dodd, do you potentially see her as a starting nine, or what do you think her best position is? Renee's a nine, um, but I'm going to say something that probably um, Renee might not like to hear. But you know, um, you know the perfect fourteen. The perfect yeah. fourteen is Renee Target, and it's not because she's not strong enough. She's definitely a starting nine, but because she she's not the best halfback or five eight, but she can slot in there. Yeah. So the fact that she is. A backup player. I think Sowie signed her up as a starting nine, but that yeah. nothing's guaranteed in LW. So um depends on their preseason. We don't get involved in all that, as you can imagine. But she got signed up as a starting nine. Um, but both hookers that I got over there are mine. Um, the yeah. next person is Sophie Clancy. That's something I don't think many people know about. Um, the, the only reason why Renee might not start as a nine is because of Sophie Clancy. So yep. she signed up as a starting nine, but I still think Renee, yes, deserves a starting spot, but she she knows how to, like, Sally can bring on the second hooker and um, throw Renee in a lock position. He played her at prop, the smallest prop in the world. Mm. He played her everywhere, and she she's capable. She's really um, game smart. But... I think the one person that's going to um, push her back to a 14, I think, um, I'm, I'm got a calculated guess on this, is when you guys get to see Sophie Kilancy play, she is one of my favourite players, this girl. She, she, um, um, that's the girl she, from Newcastle. She's from Newcastle, isn't she? She is special. She yeah. is absolutely special. And, you know, the funny thing is, not many people sort of, um, brought up the name of Sophie Clancy. Um, but when we got her on board, I was I already knew who she was. She was actually one of my players that I'm targeting. I go targeting players that I believe that we can make a difference with. Um, and then Jamie rings me up and Sophie Clancy, and I just got excited because she's special. And she is. She's a real smart footy uh, player. She's She's got a mixture of um, a bit of Keely Davis in her, but she's... How do I say it? she's more polished in a way and she's still learning? But yeah. she's not, she doesn't take a, a backward step. She won't, she'll chance her hand and she's not scared to break routine to create something. Does that make yeah. sense? Well, I you read know. she can play a bit of halves as well. Is 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 she primarily hooker or she can she can um play a bit of halves? Well, Do you expect her to mainly Renee, play nine or Renee Renee's played more halves than Sophie. 
but I will tell you that I believe Safe is probably going to be a better fit for the halves than Renee. So, yeah. and that's a really good problem to have because Sowie, I can see why one of both is he's got two starting nines and he's going to, I think he's going to run with um, Renee being the experienced half. And she's very experienced. Oh, yeah. Probably one of the most experienced, but um, just because of the headset. But he can start with Sophie and he can also start. Safe in the halves. If there's a if there's a problem with the spine, these are sort of plays you don't have to carry too many halves. So he's got virtually two hookers and two halves, and he's also yeah. got a fifth backup that if he has to, you know, you, I think Zali can play anywhere too if you need her to. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, I think he's really got a down pat. I think his biggest headache is who he's going to start out of Sophie and Renee. And it really, I think, is going to depend on who the opposing hooker is going to be or which team we're going to play. Yeah. But he's got two starting um, halves. And I think you guys are going to – I know you guys are massive Keely Davies fans, and so am I, but I see the game different. I, I see Keely as probably one of the best possible 13s in the game. I don't see her as a starting hooker. Um, I know everyone else does, but I think she's going to be – she's a hungry player and she's very fit, yeah. very smart. Ultimate competitor, yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 I think she's going to be, I think the best out of um, Keely would be thirteen, but that's just coming from me. She might not appreciate that, and then that way she's sort of like an eighty-minute player personally that can really control the, um, the middle forwards. Um, so having these two starting, I think, is um, a real good problem to have for Jamie Soward. Well, now you mentioned that, like that's how. Um... That's how he used um Keely Davis and Quincy Dodd last year. Like Keely Davis would start the games at nine, and then when Quincy Dodd would come on, Keely Davis would move to to that lock role, and it's sort sort of like you could compare it to say Ben Hunt and Harry Grant when they play in the Queensland Origin side, sort of a one two shootout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's you know that's something that I think Sally is the first to perfect. To be honest with you, um, I don't think Keely realised she's a she can play lock, um. But I, but if you look at their shape, well, Quint depends on who that second hooker is. Um, there are times you couldn't get Quincy on. There was times you had to bring Keely back in there. You know, purely because of experience. Um, she's a real experienced um, competitor, Keely. But I think um, when Quincy comes on, she's just got that real explosiveness to her, mm. and she's got that urgency. I love the way she's clapping her hands and trying to quicken the play the ball, you know, get the ball out to the half straight away. And they're two different players. Two yeah. Keely's got some muscle to her, muscle weight to her, where Quincy's just got that agility to her. Yeah. Two different type of speed players. But I think um, that combination of Keely and Quincy is a, a real combat, a real good combat to have. But I think you're going to find with the difference with um, um, Sophie Clancy and Renee Target, it's going to be more of a backup half hooking role and yeah. possibly third option would be in the forwards. Um, totally different than Keeley and uh, Quincy. That would be my guess. Yeah, like Renee, Renee obviously, um, she played a few different roles in the side in yeah. her two seasons so far. Like, But she always seems like she's a workhorse. Yeah, she and is. And she, she just jumps in and goes where she plays and but you see you see her best position as a nine or yeah it is a nine um if we I was funny because when we spoke about that last I um I said to Rona had we started our preseason with her playing in the halves I really think she'd be a real polished um really good half to be honest with you. but we haven't played enough games in the halves. Yeah. Um Harvey Norman half is totally different than NRLW. Yeah. Um, you know, she can handle Harvey Norman really well, but you put in NRLW, you can cost your team a game. And Renee's she she's mindful of that. And you know, Sow is very aware of that too. So there she's more of a backup half, but she is that I there's a lot I love about Renee when she starts. She knows how to help out the forwards. She really gets in there defensively. Um, but her attack she scoots, she makes breaks. You know, every time she scoots, she's got a minimum of 10 metres under her belt, if not more. She's always finding these little holes. And Renee, looking small, I can tell you, she's tougher than what you think. She's busted a few holes open, if you remember her playing, but she's a solid um, – she's she's she doesn't make that too many errors either. A very good worker. So when she comes off, you know she's deserved that break. Yeah. And the next you got um, – well, that, that... – 
Um, Maddie Mulholtz, who's a development player, one of yours as well. Yeah, I've, seen, I've actually two. seen. Um, yeah, Sorry. I've seen her. I'm um, come. Actually, I was watching a game. Uh, I think it was back in Easter. They played um North Sydney down at Collies in Wollong. I was at that game, and she made some strong carries. And was that a round game or trial game? I think it was a Harvey Norman game. They played North Sydney. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, yeah, she she made she she um she made her presence felt like she ran over the top of some girls and knocked something over. Can you tell us a bit about her? She's graduated from that Tasha girl straight to Harvey Norman. So I, obviously, I, Sour has a high, high rating of her. I don't know what Sal he thinks sometimes because he does my head in, to be honest with you. But he's got a real gift. Every time he likes a player, I can tell you a secret about Sowie. Every time he likes a player, player, he will never talk much about that player. And he'll come in low ball. He'll come in nice and soft. Tell me a little bit about Madison Mohol. Or tell me a little bit about Renee Target. Um, tell me a little bit about Sophie Clancy. He won't tell you what he already knows. So i tell you what happened with um, Madison Moho. We were at a trial game, and it was um, at Illawarra, and, and it was Steelers versus Dragons, you know, both clubs playing against each other. And I got there just as um, the Dragons took the field in Tasha Gale. And I know this might hurt a lot of you people, but I'm a massive fan of the Steelers Lisa Fiola team. They've got a... Mate, wow, they just blew everyone away at the um that competition they had um previous to the Lisa Fiola competition. They had a, a weekend round away, they just killed everyone. So I wanted to try and get their game, but it just didn't uh it wasn't on. So I went and watched Tasha Gale. Um there was there was a couple of players in the Dragons that sort of have some potential but need a lot of work. But the one person that stood out for me was this Madison Molehole. And I said, who's this? I looked at her game and I don't think she actually knew what she was doing. All she knew is if she's going to run, she's going to she's going to knock a few people over. And if she's going to tackle, it doesn't matter who she hurts, she's going to do her job. So the, the raw they are, the more excited I get because teaching someone how to play and getting them developed is something um, our crew at Excel, our coaching staff at Excel find easy to do. It's the attitude, then the sprint coaching, then it's the one percenters. We haven't done anything with Madison Moho yet. We just we do a lot of talking to get an understanding, finishing off the season. But unfortunately, the Dragons probably only had about three, four players that could sort of make a difference. They didn't have a full team. And all credit to the, the players, they tried their best. They just um they need a whole new season, a really good preseason. But Madison Moho. Uh, midway through the year, I um, had a chat with a dad, um, uh, Adrian, for a while, um, talking about our program. Then we finally got her signed up and met with um, um, Adrian and his wife, Georgina, and then Maddie and I had a real surprise for uh, Madison. I didn't tell him this, but once we are getting the contract ready, going up to meet, we met at the Dragons. I thought it was fitting to meet at the, the St. George Leagues Club. Um, we went in there. And all they saw was Tara McGrath West coming with them. And you got to see her eyes light up. It's, they're two similar players. That's the reason why I brought her down. Yeah. And you look at this girl, her legs are like tree trunks. Mm. They're solid. And she's now learning a bit about sprint coaching. She's now learning about conditioning. So I still see Maddie as a very raw player, um, but she is – another time McGraw West where this is what she wants. She says to me, John, I, I want to play for Australia. Please don't laugh at me. I said, that's the perfect answer. Because if you can tell me from you want to play for Australia, it means you're willing to, to start creating some goals and start setting some goals and start mm-hmm. beating those goals. That's exactly what she's doing. Her goal is to play for Australia. Um, NRLW, when we surprised her with a – I had a chat with Sally before we signed her – and um, he was going to offer the development um, spot, the first spot there. And I'm now of the opinion, and I, um, she's a development player, but there is a clause that for development players, if a player gets injured, they can still use a development player. Yep. So there's a small possibility Madison Mohol 
if a Ford goes down, my pick could get Madison Mole straight up there because she has no fear. She has no fear um, or regards for her own her own safety. She she just backs herself. She's a very um, unique competitor. She's she's very well raised. They just know they got to earn their spot. They're very um, they're very realistic. A very realistic family. Madison is sort of brought up really well to say, I'm going to get there, John. It's not a matter um, if I will be getting there. It's a matter of when, and we can use all the help we can with our training. So her first preseason is going to be this September, and I can't wait to get into preseason. Um, but Madison Mulhall, my favourite game is nothing to do with the St. George Colours. If you looked at that Rise program that was just before the State of Origin. Oh, yeah, I did see that. That on socials, yeah. I thought that was her best game all year. Um, she was playing with mixed players. Um, there was a lady that was over the 30s, maybe in 40s, I don't know her age. Um, she was co captain of that team, yeah. with that old lady. And um, Madison, even they got smashed, but Madison really put in. I was so impressed by the way she played. And she's Madison's the sort of player like Alexis. They're not Tasha Gale type of players. You need to put them in hard with Norman to see what they actually play like. Um, yeah. Some people go backwards and because it's just too far for them. Well, these girls need that extra punishment. They need that extra speed for them to shine. So um, if you see Alexis in Harvey Norman, she's a much better player than she's in Tasha Gale because Tasha's real too slow for them. And I think Madison's got the same problem. So Madison started to work on her fitness to get that right. And um, she's, she's pretty much um, on the right track by the time we get to um, – Pre says it's that she knows the target Broncos she has to come in at before we get there. All my players know what they need to be fit at before they come. To, they're not going to be wasting my time. I've got some surprises with them. I think we've got um Craig Sandicott, one of the best coaches in that field, going to be uh, put his hand up. He wants to join in that pre says and get these girls um, ready to where they need to be. Um, so I'm I'm really excited for Madison Mohol. I I I'd be very shocked if Madison Mulhall doesn't get a uh, NRLW contract next year. I'll be very shocked, but we'll make sure we prepare for that and she'll be ready for it. She will she will have her hands up from um, pre-season. Um, she will be playing NRLW next year. I'm quite confident. And I think Sowie sees that too. He doesn't sign development players unless he sees that. Um, yeah. And I think you still got Cortez, Tapao. Yes. So Cortez. tell us a bit about her. I've looked her up on... Um, a lot. There's not a lot of her. Can you, you won't give us a bit rundown of Cortez? That's the girl that I punch on with the most, I think, because um, she's a tough cookie. Um, yep. She's um, very competitive in a way. She just wants to win. Yep. Um, she's very hard on herself. She also knows how to switch from laughing, enjoying with her friends and training. Um, she came to us hating training by the way she didn't really like the train much but um i gotta tell you her pre-season with us this year she showed up every time and i got to know cortez the power a lot more this pre-season that we had um she's a winger that came out of north sydney bears um she took a, a chance leaving new zealand leaving her family she's on her own over here. she doesn't have anyone over here she took a chance came with nothing worked her ass off pay rent share accommodation, um, had to find a way to and from training. She did it the hard way, but these Kiwi kids, they just don't whinge. They just do. And that's mm-hmm. something I admire about her. And she um, did that. And North Sydney Bears was a bit of a hike to where she was living. It was, And to come to my pre-season, she had to catch a bus and a train to get to my pre-season. And she'd always find a way, being an island, uh, a Kiwi kid, to suck me into dropping her off at home. And being a sucker, I am, I ended up doing that. So Cortez is a real tough kid, but has a real soft spot in her heart. But I'll tell you one thing. She knows how to finish when she's on the wing. She knows how to finish, but I don't think wing is her position. And I'm hoping Jamie sees the same thing personally. Um, she can't play wing as a backup, but I think um, um, I don't I don't think – I think she's more of an edge player personally somewhere in the forwards because she's got that – I don't think she's fast enough to be one of those. Like, she's no flash. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Teague and Berry will leave it for dead. But then you yeah. look at um, – that's my point. So, I, I think she's um, she's sort of a play that's um, 
got that real top speed for an edge player, if that makes sense. Yeah. I know she can play centers, but she hasn't had much practice there. Um, the one thing I did in my preseason, get her to understand how she runs lines. Um, and what I did is I actually put her at 5 eight just to get some ball out there. And do you know what the funny part is? And I told Sally this, but I reckon you'd forget it really quickly. But she's got some really good, good um, ball skills, really good ball skills, some really good agility yeah. there. So... I think she's got a deserved deserve spot there, someone that Jamie picked out. But I, I think he's, again, Jamie's different than everyone else. He's not signing her up as a winger. I've got a feeling he's going to use her as um, a backup in the forwards so they can have a good rotation, personally. Okay, so you, you reckon she's a, more of an edge forward, back, back roller? Well, if he hasn't got the two wingers, and I think he might have them locked in because Taylor... Um, Mapasua? Yeah, she... I, I see when she last played, she was brilliant. So she's got some speed, that girl. Um, and she's a strong player too. So I think he's got them covered. I'm not too sure, but I'm not sure. I, I He'll have her as a wing or a backup wing, but I I reckon if he wants a season preseason, he'd know by now. Um, I've got a feeling he's going to use her somehow in the forwards because she's a very strong girl. She's a really strong girl. Mm, okay. Cortez, yeah. Does that cover all your, that's yeah, all your players in the squad? Like I said, I'm waiting on a phone call that's going to be a, another surprise inclusion. Okay. Because there might be a, an unfortunate dropout, most possibly. Um, And if that does happen, and it's unfortunate because um, I think he's got a really good squad. I don't want anyone to miss out. I think what he's got there are all deserved um, players. Um, so it's more of a wait and see. Um, I've got another club got the same problem, so they're waiting for a um, um, another player to get signed in, but they'll um, looking at the um, NRL to get an exemption for a player. But um, I can virtually tell you that there's another player that's going to be added to the Roosters lineup too. That's one of ours that we're looking forward to, but I won't announce that. Wait to the club to do that. I'm actually just got the contract as we're talking. It just came in to get signed. So that's exciting. Okay. So there might be another. Um, I, I'd like to say I hope there isn't because I think he's got some good strike power in the squad, but there might be um, an injury or something of the like that might. I think they're waiting on results or something that might there might be a dropout um and they meet to get another player and it's unfortunate because we've sort of got all the really good players um locked up all across the country, if that makes sense. So um there are still a few out there. There's one player that I think is gonna be playing um NRLW in two twenty-four. Um and she might be looked at if that spot does come available. Um, but I don't know. There's there's probably about four, four or five players that can take a spot up there, but I'll find out more tomorrow, hopefully, um, the day after. But if you hear something, you'll know that what we're talking about, basically. Yeah. So of the players you have on the books at the Dragons, yeah, who do you think will have the the big breakout season? We had, we saw Tara and McGraw West have the breakout season last year. Who do you think has the breakout season in NRLW from the Dragons, on, from your players this year? Uh, that's a really hard one, mate. I really can't because they're all capable. But, you know, if I was to say Alexis to an Arne, uh, I don't know how many boxes this, um, any more boxes this girl can tick. She's just, if you understand rugby league, it's not how many tries you score. It's just the way you run. But one thing you girls might, you guys might find out is, she ain't going to only be playing props. She's capable of playing a different position. She's got some real good uh, ball handling skills. So I just know Jamie. Jamie's just painfully annoying. He just reads them really well, and he sort of changes things around. And that's why I trust him. That's why he gets first pick of these players. So I think Alexis, um, I do know, um, you know, Tekka's going to be what she did in the Bulldogs. She just got everyone off their feet. She just done a fair bit of damage. But the dark horse, there's two. Um, Sarah Satia, I don't think Australia's seen her play at her best yet. And if we can get Sarah Satia 
ready in time, and I think she will be. She's a hidden gem. When she yep. hits a line, she's going to break that line. She never got that right opportunity, even though she played every game at the Broncos. She wasn't played right, if that makes sense. She was that optional runner where the option never goes. She was more of a decoy than an option. I'm not a fan of decoy. She's more of an option runner where the option's going to be there. She's going to hit that line. She's so solid, mate. She's so solid. And then you got Sophie Clancy, I think is – I just think, uh, you know, two years in NRW, she'll be very special, but I just think she's going to – she's that sort of hungry type of player that's going to say, no, I'm not waiting two years to get my name out there. I'm going for it now. She's that sort of player. Yeah. So I've noticed, like a bit of a while ago, you 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 mentioned um, Jamie Sow in your eyes is the best coach in the NRLW. Um, he hasn't won a premiership, but um, I've noticed the last couple of years, like his his first season, he won the um, coach of the year. Like he got his team to the grand final his first season, had a great uh, had a great side for the first two years, like. Well, look at the site. Look at the players he had. Players like Keely Davis, Kezi Yaps, and Emma Tonegato, Shaley Bent, Talia Fumano, Tegan Berry, um, just to name a few. Um, and like Tegan Berry and Keely Brown are two of the best young players in the game, I reckon. And you can add Tara McGraw West in that, that caliber as well. Um, so, what do you think? Why do you think Jamie Sauer is the best? Um, is the best coach in NRLW, and what do you admire too about the way he um, develops players? What do you see of him that makes him best above, say, a John Strange who won last year's comp at the start of the year, and then Ron Griffiths won the recent one with Newcastle? So, why is Jamie South the best over these other ones? I want to clarify. I don't say he's the best coach. I always say he's one of the best coaches. So, for me, and I don't want to name who the other other two or three are, but he's, um, I think there's about three to four coaches that um, do get it. And I'll tell you why I think Jamie Sauer is definitely one of the ones up the top for me. Um, If you look at John Strange when he first started, um, John's always been that development type of coach. He's actually a real smart man. Um, I don't think he sort of went into it as a coach. He went into it as a development coach where he developed players um, and he had some superstars in there, the ones that he yeah. picked up, the ones that he created. I think at that stage when he took over the Roosters in that, you had Jess Sergis and you had Isabel Kelly, and where they were playing, yes, they were good players, but he had to change the way they played also. Hmm. Um, so he sort of developed those players. Like Isabel Kelly is, uh, for me, is one of those must-have centres. Yeah, best um, centre in the game. Yeah. And I think John Strange has got a lot to do with that, to be honest with you. So I don't want to say Jamie's the best coach because John, I know what his strengths are. But John, I think you're finding that rather than being one of the best development coaches, I think he's starting to be one of the best NRLW coaches too. Um, I get um, with um, with the Knights winning, um, mate, I'm not overly convinced, to be honest with you. I'm not saying he's not a great coach at all. Don't. I would not disrespect any coach that's coaching at the moment because they've earned their spot and they are really good in their own ways. Um, but when you um, got the likes of those sort of players that he just brought over, um, for me, um, before Emma Tomagato was a gun fullback, you had Tamika Upton. She was the Australian fullback. She was yeah. very fast. She was very mm. different. And But but do you see how they develop? So when you talk about Jamie getting the coach of the year in his first year, um, you've got to understand, you know, he, uh, Kezi Yaps, Amber Um, um like Rachel Pearson is another yeah. one that I don't yeah. think was a half, but I think Jamie put a lot of work into one. She got that uh, opportunity of origin. And I think Jamie mm. did a lot of that help behind the scenes. Um, Kelly Davis, I, I, I don't want to be rude, and I think a lot would disagree with what I say. But if you look at these sort of players that wanted to make a break, it was I wanted to play in RLW. Jamie gave them opportunity. Now, all of a sudden, with all that work and all that understanding and all that structure and all that development, you end up adding value to your name. And when you yeah. add value to your name, there was never going to be an opportunity for Jamie to be able to retain those players. If you look at a 900000 salary cap, people seem to think that, you can buy all the players that he's got and retain them all. You can't even meet the minimum um, salary sacrifice 
to fill up the balance of your squad. There's 24 in a squad. If you paid the money these um, players are asking or their agents are asking for, you couldn't even fill up the whole balance of the 24. So you couldn't have a squad of 18. This is what no one seems to realise. So if 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 Keely Davis is not a $30,000 player, um, Emma Tomogato is not a $30,000 player. No. So then, then how... So if 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 the Dragons went in and said, you know, we're happy to pay you um, $60,000 or $70,000 for argument's sake, you're going to have the Knights that will say, we'll pay you eighty. Then you'll have the Broncos that will say, we'll pay you ninety. Then you'll have the Cowboys, we'll pay you hundred. And where does it end? But can yep. you do that for every single player? No, you can't. It's no, no good having Emma Tomagoda and pay her overs and not able to have the spine to create it to Emma Tomagoda because... Without a spine, Emma Tomogata is not going to get good ball, if that makes yeah. sense. You know what I mean? So Jamie sort of has to find the balance, and that's what makes a really good coach. And John Strange is sweet with that too. you got to find the balance. And and there's a really good coach that's coming in the market now, um, Darren Borthwick. He's uh, Bordo. He's the Raiders coach. Yeah. Uh, what people seem to forget is Mounties were in the um, – Premiership. They won the premiers, um, Premiership Grand Final this year. They were Premiers last year. This didn't come from nothing. And I know there's a training squad. I get all that. But Darren's been in the game for a while, and he worked with Keely Davis. He worked with um, um, Tamar Matalfa. He worked with all these gun players that you're talking about. So it started from back then, and this bloke is um, being picked up by the Raiders. I'm surprised no one was picking up, but he's actually a really good coach. And you don't be surprised that – the Raiders, that probably couldn't attract that many players because not many people know who this coach is, but he's a bloody gun coach. But not many people want to live in Canberra and train in the winter. It's really, really cold. Yeah, over yeah um, 100%. Not many people want to drive three hours to train three hours back. So he's got to – but I think once people know what he achieves, I think me personally, um, I probably will send some players there next year when he puts his hand up for him, but – uh, because I know what sort of coach he is. It's a lot of gun players that are coming into the market. I know what he's going to do with him. He's a really good coach. So Jamie Sowd, for me, is not based on his first year, and it wasn't based on his second. It's just that you find his second year was actually better than his first year, if you want to know the truth. But trying to find a transition in developing players and adding value is his strength. But the problem is when you start to add value to these players, you make some bad calls. So yep. not every player is going to be picture perfect. For me, it's never about a structured play. It's about trusting your players to get developed, to be able to call a structured play. And that's the part where I think went pear-shaped. So having the right coaching team around you, I think you find Jamie's got a new coach team around him now with no discredit to the other ones, but not everyone's on the same page. But the problem we have is you need to be on the same page as the head coach. And if you're not, the message is not going to be relayed. Mm -hmm. And the bigger your name becomes, the more you have a say in the team. And that's got to stop because you're still – we're not close to the men's game yet. And I'm not a fan of hearing, oh, the women's game bores the hell out of me. To be very honest with you, a women's game is actually more entertaining for me than a man's game is because you can yeah, see that growth. That growth and – the way they put their body in the line, no one understands what they do in that mm. game and how to prepare for the game. And if you think $30,000 is a fair number for these girls, and for, for a lot of them it's a lot, but it isn't. It needs to be at least double, you know what I mean, at this stage because um, these girls, are the, the skill level that's starting to get shown now, and if you look at their body shape, the body reshaping of their shape, so we work on – body reshaping, the nutritional diets they've got to go through. They still might have a family that they've got to go look after. They might have a partner they, they're they married to. They might be planning for a kid, which they've got to put on hold. They still have a job where they've got to try and finish early, sacrifice some money to get to the game. But there's so much we're behind the game. And to give us a product of um, a good game of footy after everything they've got to go through, I think um, – we need to really applaud these girls for everything, they, the entertainment they're putting for us. And unfortunately, I don't think the NRL has jumped on this soon enough. I think they should have, you know, come to the party a lot earlier. And thankfully, they're starting to realise that now and they're, um, they're on their way to do that. But you, you've got, you know, Harvey Norman that have been pushing for this for a long, long time. And 
and there's no other way because they've been putting their money where their mouth is, to be honest with you. And you've got a lot of female um, businesswomen that are starting to sort of buy into the game at the moment. You've got a lot of clubs that are buying into there. But the problem I have with clubs, and I'll give you a really good example, is um, you've got the Bulldogs, you've got the Dragons, you've got um, the Roosters. They might have an NRLW club. But that does not mean they actually care about that NLW club. It's yeah. just ticking the boxes to say, yeah, we've got NLW too. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that needs to change and it's going to be mm-hmm. changing sooner because they're going to be called out. And I'm sort of black that doesn't sit back. Um, I'm not a fan of clubs that don't sort of give that emphasis to these female athletes because they deserve all the attention they get. So having Jamie Sauer to put all the time he is, if you ask Jamie Sauer, do you want to, um, start a pathway in the first grade coach, his yep. answer would be no one to stick with the female pathways because he knows what he can offer and he gets a buzz out of um, ticking boxes. Um, so for me, Jamie Soward, his brains, um, as unorthodox as it is, he really gets the transition from male to female and he's really adding value in the way he's selecting players. You can see, so the four outgoing forwards that are left the Dragons, right? If you compare the stats of the four incoming forwards, the, the four that I've just named, um, um, Alexis to an RNA, Saros to uh, um, Teka, Teka Katoa, and then you've got Tama Grow with, if you just look at their stats alone versus the outgoing, um, their stats are actually doubled. Mm. So if you look at rather wow. because you guys got really excited, or how do we lose this play, or how do we lose Kezi, and how do we lose, it's not about who you lost, it's about we couldn't afford to keep what Jamie Soward added value to. But we got a bargain because we've got some that are coming at a lower price that are not really known, but looking at the stats, today it's not about who I say or who I sell. Today's about stats. Today's about performance. Today's about how can I improve this girl and can she contribute into that NRLW Dragon squad? That's how Jamie looks at it, and that's why I've got a lot of respect for him. And the biggest problem I got, and I know you're going to ask me this question, why are we only done one year duels at the Dragons? Is that what you wanted to know? Well, yeah, actually, a lot of people have thrown that to me, like, because if Jamie is has an eye on the future and wants to get these all all these young girls, um, well, there's actually a few young forwards too that obviously aren't yours as well. Like, there's there's names like Macy Carlisle, um, yeah. Other, other, there's other um, young forwards in that side that no one really has. Carla Cowan's another one. Yeah, Maddie Weatherall's a one. Well, she's been in the system before. She's hasn't she played for years now. Player of the year back then. Yeah, she was a like, freak. Um, one of my favorite players back then. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm a f- big fan of her. She has again, she has that big energy. Um, yeah. knocks people over with she. She runs real hard. Um, yeah. Anyway, get back to what I was saying. Um, yeah, like. If Jamie has an eye on the future, shouldn't he be locking these players in long term so they can gel and combine and get these combinations going so they are so in a couple of years that they, they become one of those benchmark sides in the competition? Because you look at the other sides, they've got a lot of experience in those in those ones. Like I've I've heard that people saying that the Broncos and the Roosters are the benchmark teams based on the rosters they've got this year. What 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 what's what do you think Sauer's plan is with only having these most of these players signed on one year deals? Yeah. Okay, so I was hoping not to answer this question, but I will because I'm a straight shooter. Um, I just think it's something that um, Jamie should have really answered, but I will tell you the answer. Um, for me, I don't manage a coach; I manage mm-hmm. a player. And if I work with a lot of coaches and we get on really well. I would never put that person before my player because my role is to manage the player. So whatever the best interest is not about the Dragons, not about the Roosters, whatever is best for my player is what I do. So we might have an offer for argument's sake, $60,000 at um, the Broncos, for argument's sake. Um, Depends on what position it is. Um, But I've only got $45,000 at the Dragons and I've opted to go with the Dragons because – $60,000 $60,000 last year at the Broncos, I didn't really feel that um, the coach last year was going to add value to that player 
and yeah. might not get an opportunity next year. So their sixty thousand dollars might not have been worth thirty thousand this year. And if we go to the Dragons and Jamie says, "Well, I know where I'm going to play. I know what I need to fix," but he finish, she'd finish the season, and she probably might be valued at sixty thousand the following year. But he's actually developed her. And then what happens there is I try my best to keep Jamie Soward with the younger girls that I bring in. I want them there for at least two years with Jamie. That's my thing. Tara McGrath West, just so that everyone knows, um, had pretty much all the clubs chasing her. But mm-hmm. And Jamie had nothing riding with me, but he had my word. But I wanted Jamie to work with her for two years for my player's sake, not for Jamie's sake. Jamie was scared of not getting her back. But I wasn't looking at Jamie. I was looking at Tara McGraw West. Another year under Jamie Soward, she'd be very special. Um, and we know what he he bled her in. He bled her in the first game, the second game, third game, and she got better and better, like we spoke about in the yeah. beginning. Game four, powerhouse. There's a lot of work that goes into a behind the scenes with Jamie Soward. And then game five was my favorite. So he's very mindful of what he's doing, his plays, and he's adding that value. Um, so the big question is why am I not? If you look at, I don't know if you've seen the release of all contract, um, all clubs and contract players and how long they've signed for. You look at the Dragons. Dragons are the only ones that have got single um, years done. Every other yeah, club, every other club's got two thousand twenty four, two twenty five, some twenty six. Do you know what I mean? Dragons yeah. are like two or four players that players have mutual option, options, mutual and options, things, club option, yeah. When it's a mutual option, it's generally it's like if we do well, we'll keep you, and if you don't, we don't need you. That's what it means. Yeah. Um, uh, club option is um, if we don't think you're going to improve, you're out. So they to respectfully they do a mutual option. When it's a player option, it's it's a fair call because me, I'd have a player option because if I know that girl's achieved the where she needs to be and we've got a really good deal somewhere else, I need to have that option to do that. And, yeah. But I would say to him, at this stage, we're committing for X amount of years, but we need this year as a player option, this year as a player option. Um, and generally, I like to keep them there for a couple of years. But in saying that, um, if you asked me when we started signing contracts, um, what would be the percentage of our players returning that he had signed? It was probably about um, 80 to 90% of them committing to a second-year deal straight away. So what, what has changed? And Jamie wanted to. And he said, mate, can we get a couple of years in there? And I said, mate, it's not going to happen. He goes, we'll do it in your option, player option. I said, I'm not, I'm not interested. And the truth is, Jamie Soward is the reason why I'm going for the drag. I'm going to the Dragons. It's got nothing to do with the Dragons. It's got nothing to do with the actual Dragons itself. Um, I, 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 I just think that Jamie Soward, the way he coaches, what is what makes the NRLW Dragons a really good show. And then the next coach that comes in needs to be a better type of coach in a way that yeah. he wants to continue. You don't just go pick up anyone else. That To me, that's a disrespect of the club in saying that. But Jamie Soward, his contract runs out in June. I don't think anyone knows mm-hmm. this. And how do I commit to 24 and 25 if I don't know who's going to be the next year? What if it ends up being a coach that I don't rate that's going to send the players back you. So mm-hmm. let's just say, Jess, you've got a daughter that plays NRLW. Yeah. And I manage her. I'm asking you, you're a mad NRLW Dragons fan, right? Yep. And I'm asking you as a father, as a father, um, we got an offer for two years at the Dragons. Um, first year is going to be Jamie Soward. Um, I don't know who's going to be the coach next year. Mm. And your daughter's only fresh into that squad. So she's in that apprenticeship stage where she needs to learn to add value. Mm. Or Jess, you know what? We got, I know that um, Darren Borthwick's locked in for a couple of years, but there's a bit of a height to go there, but he's a really good coach. If you care about your daughter, I don't care what I got to go. I want the best for her. But then you got, hang on, I've got John Strange that wants her. And he's a really good coach. He's locked in Mm. for at least three years. Um, Where do you want to go? As a father, what do you think I should be doing? Taking a um, putting my blinkers on and just taking a gamble with the dragons because you go for the dragons. But as a father, um, it'd be it'd be clumsy to say we have to stick to the dragons. So I've got to carry that responsibility too at the same time. Yeah. I've got to do best for these players that are also young. 
I'm 55 um, years of age. These girls are like, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Yeah. They're still learning um, to find their feet at the same time in the big world. They've still got a massive life ahead of them. I don't mm. want to be part of making the wrong decision for these guys. It's not about who I fancy, who I don't fancy. It's what offers they have on the table and and which is the best opportunity out of those offers. So there's a couple of girls that have got offered two years and three years. And I know the coaches are locked in for that long. Yeah. But we opted to go one year with the Dragons. I think I've done the right thing by Jamie Salad and the players because i got to believe that these girls are going to get better. That's the gamble we're taking. Because if they don't, if they're at the end of the age of year, I'd go for what's higher money and what's better length of contract. If at the end of the age, I'll take what's better for them. But at the beginning of your age, they're going to be 10-year players. They're going to be around for at least 10 years. Mm. We hope to. Yeah. So you've got to really manage that very carefully. And whilst Jamie Soward isn't locked in for, you know, the next three years, I will refuse to be signing an extension on those contracts without disrespecting the club. But I think in this, um, at this um, point, I think the club's probably got this wrong. Um, and I, I already know of a club, um, that's looking at Jamie Sauer's services two twenty five. I already know of a club that wants it. Yeah. Um, and his name came up with another club, but he, I think he brushed it off. From what I understand, I think he, um, um, I think he brushed it off. To be honest with you, I don't know the rule story. I didn't ask him, but I know of a club that's already there's there's the Warriors that are going to get locked in for two twenty five, and there's another race. I think it's going to be t- between the Bulldogs, um, the Panthers, and the Rabbitohs. Yeah. Uh, so if Jamie Sell gets out that he's not um, coaching for 224, I have no doubt there'd be clubs chasing him and locking him in because he, when, you, when you're doing an apprentice as an electrician, you do your first year, second year, third year, and then you say, uh, we don't need you anymore. How does that work? So let's yeah. go find someone that's got no experience because all these big coaches think they know what they're doing. But if you're going to come in, treat it like a men's game, you're just going to be caught out straight away. It's nothing like that. And training mm-hmm. girls is a hard gig. Training yeah. girls is a hard gig, but it's also rewarding. It's worth the pain that you go through. Um, these girls put a lot into it. Um, you know, we've got different DNAs, different testosterone levels, and you've got to be mindful and respectful at the same time. And Jamie's finally found his balance. Um, how is he not locked in for three years? God help me. I don't know. So he's only signed for this for this, but just for this 23 season, is it? I don't even think he's signed for this year, but he's doing this year. But I think okay. his contract runs out of, of memory um June this month. But that doesn't mean yeah. he's not he's not gonna be they can do by month by month basis, but he'll be there mm. for the year. But um I don't know why he's left it that long. I don't know if Jamie Soward, I don't think it's Jamie because he publicly said, and I remember this clearly that. I would rather stay in the female space because I've got a lot of work to do and I'm really enjoying my role. Um, and I think that's something the club needs to lock in straight away. Like people, all the players that I've heard that they say, do you see passion in Sour about the game? I've, I've heard that many players describe that he's passionate about the women's game. Do you see that? I'll give you a simple answer. Go follow the bloke on his social media. And then go follow his wife, Maddie Soward. You know the one thing that's always there is his two daughters. And do you yeah. know the reason why he wants to stay in that game? The reason why he's from his heart. This is what I love about him the most. Jamie Soward comes across as a bloke that um, probably has no emotions. And he's trying to find the balance to get to where he was in game one to, to year one to year three. But he's he's got so much emotion. He's like a little... Uh, princess himself around his daughters and his wife. He's extremely respectful of his wife, extremely respectful and loving of his daughters. If I've got a book call to make and I um I need to speak to him something urgent, he says, John, if it's urgent, I'll give you a minute, but I, I've got to spend that time with my daughters. Everything is family first. So when you look at the female, he's got two daughters and he's got a wife. He's got three girls in his life, right? He takes that into consideration every time he's talking and treating a girl. Every time he's working with a female, this is where his headspace is because he wants to make the game as clean as possible so that his own daughters can play the game. He has more than the passion for the role. 
if I was on the board of directors or chairman of the club, um, at this stage, there'd be three coaches I'd lock in, maybe four. Jamie probably be up there at the top. Yeah. But you already got him there. Yeah. And the people that are making decisions, unfortunately, and I, 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 I want to be as respectful as I can, I don't think they're invested um, in making the right decision based on where the female space is. I think they're more experienced in where the men's space is and they're making the right calls there or maybe not. I don't know, but I think at a board level, it, and I know they've got some female board members on that um, crew that um, they might find challenging, but they need to say, you know what, what this bloke's done and, and his, his wingman uh, snake, and he's got a big crew, Nigel, he's got a really good crew there in Nigel and snake there. They're really passionate people. You've got to go see what they did behind the scenes. Before he was due to get back on into work for NRW, Jamie was working um, with scouting and everything from February. Like, he's been putting the time in already as it is. Um, extremely passionate. I would never question his passion for the female space. That's something I can um, categorically um, say that he will always be passionate about this game. And I'd, I'd, I'd back that up every single time I hear a negative response. Yeah. Okay, John, um, that about wraps us up. Thanks very much for your time this evening. Um, thank you for coming on. Um, and I hope, I think you've answered for quite a lot of um, opinions and, and questions that Dragons fans would have about these um, unknown players. And um, yeah, hopefully you've given them some optimism about what these players can show and hopefully looking forward to the, the season and what these players can show when they um, pull on that Red V jump up. Yeah, and 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 you're very welcome. And I just love the way that the group is very passionate about um, the female space um, in the NRLW. And you guys are probably, from what I understand, ahead of all that fans base when it comes to the Dragon supporters. And I wish every club has sort of the same sort of fan base that you guys do. So um, you guys have got very passionate love for these girls, and that's what I respect the most. Thanks for your time, Jess. Thank you, John. Yeah. Okay, so thanks again. Thanks for John for coming on for that. So now with we've got the um now that we've got that sorted, now we'll move on to our um I'll run through a bit of info about our NRLW squad for twenty twenty three. So here is our here is our top twenty four. So our finalised NRLW squad. So our first signing was Bobby Law. So Bobby Law comes from the central coast of New South Wales. She has established herself as an elite player in the NRLW. She's primarily a centre. She's previously played for the Australian Prime Minister's 13, also an Indigenous All-Stars representative, and has played with the Sydney Roosters and Newcastle Knights. Premiership winner with the Knights in the 2022 NRLW season. And yeah, she was our first signing once the CBA um, contract window did open back in March. Our next one is uh, Renee Target. So she was one of the first to re-sign, um, playing with us in the 2021 and 2022 competitions. She has a sporting um, path unlike others in the rugby league world. She has, she's been a long-term Australian-American football representative. She was 18th woman in the New South Wales origin side in 2021. Still relatively new relatively new to the to the um, rugby league game, but um, has taken it, taken to league like a duck to water. She can either play halfback or hooker or wherever Jamie Sow or coach Jamie Soward requires her to play. Outside of footy, Target uh, works as a facilitator of employment skills in education and training, and she is um, 28 years of age. Um, Bobby Law is 26. Now, next one, so we've got Tara McGraw-West, another one of the re-signings that John touched on just a bit earlier. So one of the standout performances in our side last year, just 21 years of age. She was the final signing for our 2022 season. Um, she impressed um, Jamie Soward and uh, manager Steve Nielsen following her um, show-stealing performances in the, in the um, North Sydney Bears Harvey Norman Women's Premiership Finals Series. She hails from the southwestern slopes of New South Wales, and she was only introdu introduced into the game of rugby league just five years ago. Um, she played on um, Tashkio Cup with the um, Canberra Raiders as well. So, um, 
actually touted as a as a future New South Wales and Jilla Ridge representative. So I expect Tyra Gravis to rise to another level with the um, departure of many key forwards like Kezi Apps, Holly Wheeler, and Elsie Albert this season. I expect her to um, take a spot in the starting side actually this year. And next um next one is Sarah Sortia. Sarah Sortia, um that um another one of John's players he mentioned. So she comes from the Brisbane Broncos, so she's a former Queensland under nineteen state of origin representative. This will be her third NRLW season, debuting in the twenty twenty one season. She's a back row middle forward, featuring all six games in the last season. After coming off the bench in all but one game, she'll be working hard to maintain a starting spot in the in outside the twenty twenty three. And at the moment, she is twenty. She'll be turning twenty one in August. Next player is Cortez Tipo. There's not a lot of info about her, but John, if you look to um earlier in the video, John has introduced, um, has spoken about what Cortez is all about. Um, next player is um Teka Katoa, another player um John mentioned earlier. So she she is is coming across from the Roosters NRLW side. So she's a front rower and also a lock. Played with the North Sydney Bears and the um, New South Wales Harvey Norman Wins Premiership side. And she's an exciting young player. Her name is Angelina Tika, Tiakaranga Katoa, but better, um, she prefers to be called Teka. So, yeah, she's an exciting young forward that will be coming across to um, our side in 2023. So, watch out for her. She's a um, 21 year old and is a middle forward. Next, we've got Paige McGregor. Again, we got custom to Paige McGregor um, playing in the previously 2021 and 2022 campaigns. Um, become one of the most admires. I thought she was very competitive. I loved the way she competed in everything. And she's a very tough player and um, made her debut with the Kiwi Ferns in that toss against Tonga in Auckland last year. Went on to play in the Kiwi Ferns with the, in the World Cup over there in the UK. Um, I think she's one of the best young centers in the game at the moment. Um, he's a little bit of info for her. So she came across from the um, Australian Youth Sevens, which won the, the goal at the Youth Commonwealth Games back in 2017. She made Australian Sevens debut at the Oceania Rugby Sevens and also the Dubai World Series um, in the same year. McGregor joined the Dragons in, ahead of the 2021 rescheduled season and yeah, made her debut with, with the Kiwi Ferns last year in Auckland. And McGregor is just 24. So, yeah. So, another one, not too much about, but um, Jamie Lee Bright comes. She's a, another uncapped player. So, she's coming from um, playing Harvey Norm Wins Premiership um, with the North Sydney Bears alongside um, Racine McGregor. Um, so, she's a back row. She can goal kick. Um, yeah, it should be, um, it's going to be her first time in the NRLW. So, Watch out for her as a back rower, and um, who knows, she may end up as our goal kicker. Tough player. Um, Racing McGregor, um, she was part of our 2018 inaugural season, so she played in that first game against the um, Broncos up at Suncorp Stadium. Um, completely different player to the player she is now. Reigning Dally M, player of the year, golden boot winner, three time premiership winner. Um, yeah, two premierships with the Broncos and one with the Roosters, beating us in the grand final in the 2021 season. Um, still 20, just 25 years of age, best player in the game at the moment. And, um, yeah, just recently named captain of the side as well. So I couldn't have picked of anyone better to be the captain. Um, looking forward to seeing how racing back in the Red Bay in 2023. Um, next, we've got um, Alexis Tornier. Again, John touched on her. Exciting player. Played in the um, Canterbury um, Bulldogs. Tasha Girl Cup side. Only new to the game. Came over across from New Zealand last year. Um, she um, obviously graduated straight to the Harvey Norman Wins Premiership side this year. One Tasha Girl Cup player of the year. So good. R rise to, yeah, rose to the Harvey Norman Wins Premiership Opens team. Then, then um, one player of the year at the recent national champions up there in Queensland. Um, played in the City Origin side as well. And as John said, he's she, she's a rep player of the future as well. She's predicting she'll play 
for her country by the end of next year. So, and yeah, she'll she'll be a player to watch. Five minutes. Okay, Keely Brown's another player. Um, one of our pathway players. So she's come through as a center or winger. Just come through the Illawarra Steelers system. Milton Aladala Jr. Spent three years traveling to the Illawarra from that South Coast region to um, regularly play in the Tasha Gale Cup games for the Illawarra Steelers. And then she's one of the inaugural members of the um, Dragons Academy, studying at the University of Wollong currently. And she made her NRL debut, debut last year at Wynn Stadium against Parramatta in that monsoon, um, debuted on the wing, played in that grand final as well, up there in Redcliffe against the Roosters off the bench. Um, exciting young player. I think she's got a big future in the game. Um, obviously, Ruan Sims sees that too, one of the pioneers of the, of Women's Rugby League. So she played, um, she was in that country origin side that played at Cogra about four or five weeks ago, I think it was. Um, so, yeah, big future in the game. I'm excited to see how she goes this year and hopefully it develops. And yeah, again, she's, she'll be 21 this year, so she'll be around for a long, long time. Keely Brown. Carla Cowan's a player that's come through the Illawarra system, recently played in the um, Harvey Norton Moves Premiership with the Steelers. Um, Has been touted as a player to watch for many years, but finally gets her chance on the big stage. Played in the... um. Perth Nines winning team in, back in 2020. Um, and she can play um, dummy half and lock. So um, I definitely play her to watch and watch for her to uh, claim a spot for that start, uh, number 13 role. Um, Madison Weatherall's our next one. So she was back a part of our side a couple of years ago. Won Tasha Girl Cup Player of the Year. Um, played in the 2019 Dragons NRLW Grand Final. Played also in 2020. Hasn't played for a couple of years now. Um, due to having, um, she's got a, she's a young mother now, partner of um, Dragons and Oral player Max, Max Fiona. So, um, yeah, it's going to be um good to see her back in the game. Um, hard running front rower. Um, looking forward to see how she goes. Good to see her back in the side, and hopefully she does have a good return. Um, next we've got Margot Vella, so not too much known about her. She's coming across from the New South Wales Waratahs Rugby Union. Um, she's at just at the age of 24, so she's um, one of those rugby converts, can play anywhere in the back. So there's not a lot of info about her, but I'm looking forward to see what she does and be interesting to see where she does play. Um, Ella Costa mentioned her a couple of times on the... Um, on the podcast. So she's a player that's a front rower um, playing. She was captain of the Steelers Tasha Girl Cup side that went all the way to the semi finals this year. Um, she's middle forward or edge forward. And yeah, one of one of many that have come through the um, Dragons pathway system into the NRLW squad. Zali Hopkins. So Zali Hopkins will continue her NRLW career, another player that's re signed. Um, yeah. She is a Cronulla junior, so she was close with players like we did have last year, like the likes of Tyler Holmes, Andy Roberts, and Quincy Dodd, but chose to re-sign with the Dragons, so that's a good sign that she has faith that she wants to stay. So she has a background in Oztag and Rugby Sevens, and then she moved to Rugby League in 2018. And now, last year, made her NRLW debut with the Dragons. Um, yeah, and yeah, another player that's re-signed for this upcoming season, and be interesting to see if she gets the first credit playing final for alongside um Racine McGregor. Macy Carlisle, again, a lot of player, not too much info about, but she's been playing Harvey Norman with, for, with the um Cronulla Sharks. She was in that country origin side too, um, with Killy Brown and um Tegan Berry just a few weeks ago. Jamie Sow did say she's I've uh, been training with um Bo Scott, so or well, we know how good defender Bo Scott was back in the day when we won the comp. So, um, yeah, um, young, good, exciting young player. She's only 21, so another player to watch, hopefully. Um, Sophie Clancy, another player John was mentioning, so she can play as ability to play half hooker 
was a Newcastle Knights development player last year. Apparently, she was um the Knights were disappointed to let her go, but again, player to watch. Have to wait and see um how she goes. Tegan Berry, well, we know a little about Tegan Berry. She was um top try scorer, Dally and Winger of the year last year. Really knocking on the door for those um representative sides was in that New South Wales extended squad for game one and also last year's origin. Um Tasigal Cup graduate, former athletics champion, based in Shell Harbour. And yeah, I expect her to be on uh, with the departure of um Emma Tonagot, I expect her to be the first choice fullback this year and I, I'm excited to see how she goes in her preferred position and currently playing in the um in the Harvey Norman Trevor she sold with the Steelers as well earlier this year. Um I won't be long before she um does crack those new set files in um Jillaroo's sides, I think. Roxy Murdoch Masella, so she's the wife of um NRL forward Ben Murdoch Masella, also with the Dragons. Um comes has 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 experience playing test for um the Kiwi Ferns. Um has has NRL lab experience playing previously playing with the um Broncos and Titans, so it's going to be interesting to see how, what she brings. Edge back rower, um, yeah. She had some experience there in the forward pack, so it should be good. Um, Shanae Lendl, not too much info there about her, so she's a central back rower. Been playing with the Bulldogs and Harvey Norman Women's Premiership, so um, not too much info there on her, so we'll have to wait and see what she can provide. Um, Taylor Curtis, sad story with her. She was play out through the midst of the CBA negotiations. She um, actually tore her ACL, but the RLPA and NRL were kind enough to let her um, go aside, ahead and sign anyway. So um, she won't be playing at all this year with that ACL injury, but she'll be on our books for 2024. Um, but she'll be in and around the club and you will see her around. Um, Sarah Jordan, uh, Wallaroo. So she's um, 30 years of age. Um, she has a lot of experience, Sarah Jordan. So she comes over as a Wallaroo, so can play or in, in union. She comes across as a fullback, a center, or a fly half. Um, played over 10 tests for the Wallaroos, played in the 2017 Rugby World Cup. Um, and she hails from Newcastle, has played 10 tests for the Wallaroos. Now, Thailand. Um, Indy Bostock, was one of the development players. Um, she's sister of Jack Bostock, who currently plays for the Dolphins. Again, not too much information on her, but she's been playing in the um one of another one of those Steelers on pathway players. And finally, Tyler Nathan Wong. So she comes across from the Rugby Sevens in New Zealand, um, two time Olympic medalist. Well, we know how last our uh, last um. Rugby Sevens convert went Emma Tonegato, so um, it's good good to see um another Rugby Sevens make that switch to NRLW. Um, she was a silver medalist at the Rio Olympic Games, obviously the one Australia won, um, and won a gold medal at the Tokyo Olympic Games. So she'll be twenty eight this twenty eight, so twenty nine this year. So um, yeah, she'll add some experience and maybe she will get the first crack at five eight alongside Racy McGregor. We also got four development players to add. So Ferris Sambo coming all the way from Canada, played Canada in the two in last year's World Cup over there in the UK. So coming all the way from Alberta in Canada, first Canadian to um, get a taste of NRLW. Um, she'll be one of our development players as long, along with um, Bronte Wilson, who comes across from the W rugby rugby competition, playing for the Waratahs. Um, Madison Mulhall, as John mentioned earlier, she's come through the St. George Tarsagal system, graduated to the um, Harvey Norman Wins Premiership and has been considered to get a crack at NRLW this year. Um, and Casey Ray is a, the final player on that um, development list for the Dragons. So, yeah, I'll wrap up there. That can, that runs you through our 2023 um, um, squad. Um, yeah. Any news or updates will be um, posted here on the podcast page and they'll be also available. Stay tuned to our podcast. I'll have regular updates too whenever we have our podcasts on Sundays and Tuesdays. Um, but yeah, 
thanks for tuning in for that. Um, and yeah, looking forward to this 2023 NRLW season. Chin up and Dragons fans, fire up.